Terry, I loved our last video where you gave a cutting edge recipe on how beginners can raise capital to buy their first apartment building. Today, we're shooting part two, which is on raising money from passive investors by doing a real estate syndication. For those who don't know, just tell us what is a real estate syndication? Okay, let's see if I can make this simple. I'm not really good at simple, but I'm gonna do it. A real estate syndication is a partnership between a deal sponsor, also called a syndicator, and passive investors to purchase investment real estate. And the process is all regulated by the SEC, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission. So in the last video, you stated that farming a syndication is so much work and costs a lot of money. Is it worth it to do one? Well, I think it's a no brainer. If you love income producing real estate and you want to grow your net worth much faster, there is nothing that I know, I mean, nothing that can accomplish this better than syndicating deals. So this is because you're using other people's money to get rich, right? Well, 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 of course, but you can do that without the headache of a syndication. And certainly that is always an option. Don't think you have to syndicate just because it's so cool and it's complicated and it's more, it makes you more important to call yourself a syndicator. Uh, what's so cool about syndicating is it's just so much easier to find high net worth passive investors who want absolutely nothing to do with running the property than active ones who will want to debate with you on everything. They're gonna get on your face with how much rent to charge, you know, uh, what property management to do, everything. This saves so much time versus making decisions by consensus with active investors. Right. If you use passive investors though, you will have to go through all these SEC regulations. Okay, so why is the SEC involved? Don't they just regulate the stock market? Yeah, that's what everybody thinks. But the SEC protects passive investors in real estate syndications run by sponsors for the same reason they protect passive investors in securities run by fund managers. Both could be ripe with fraud because the passive investor is not turning over every rock on the deal. And they certainly don't even do hardly any of the due diligence. They should. And they have to trust the sponsor to give them realistic projections on earnings and risks, but most importantly, importantly, to distribute the earnings to pay them. All right. So why in the last video were you so adamant that the first time multifamily property owners shouldn't attempt their first deal with a syndication? Okay. Well, firstly, I just want to say that I have closed loans on over 50 syndicated transactions. Mm -hmm. Most of my clients on these deals were highly experienced apartment buildings. I mean, sorry, experienced apartment building owners, but they were also syndicators and had great teams of professionals watching their backs. But what really impressed me were the first time deal sponsors that studied the process, made outstanding offers on outstanding properties, did their due diligence intelligently, and then just winged it. They amazed me because wait, they wait, just wait, had wait. to. Sorry to interrupt you, but in that last video, you were super adamant that this should not be done. So now you seem to be contradicting yourself by saying newbies should jump in and start syndicating deals by winging it all the way to the closing table. No, you heard me correctly. In the last video, I did strongly discourage first time sponsors from doing a syndication. Why? because it's a daunting task and you're not going to want to do this recklessly, are you? No. Um, keep in mind that as a syndicator, you have a fiduciary responsibility to protect your investors. So how can you possibly do this without experience? Well, I'm just telling you that I've seen it happen many times. Dante Bellamonte of New York, he is definitely the youngest sponsor I have ever worked with at the age of 22, he just closed 22. his first, yeah, 22, <laughs> believe Amazing. it or not. He just closed his first syndicated deal on a 24 unit this week. And he has a 32 unit, unit building already under contract for his next syndication. Dante has a podcast called Make Money Make Sense in Real Estate. Um, and it's a great podcast. I've been a guest on it. Uh, <laughs> but anyway... But of course, Dante, I think, is probably you know like a prize fighter of having confidence in doing real estate transactions. Sounds like it. Good for him. 
Yeah. Okay, I think you all get it that syndications are complicated, but the thought of starting one gets your adrenaline going and you're willing to not take shortcuts. Don't take shortcuts. You can do this. In this video, I will be going over just the basics of what you really wanna know. How much do sponsors have to put in of their own money? Everybody wants to know that. How are the profits split? What fees can the sponsors charge? What are the qualifications for passive investors? And most importantly, I think, who finances syndications? Hello and welcome to the Encyclopedia of Commercial Real Estate Advice Channel, where we give insider tips on over 500 real estate topics from the book, the Encyclopedia of Commercial Real Estate Advice by Terry Painter. Terry is a writer for Forbes.com and the president and founder of Apartment Loan Store, where he's financed over $4.5 billion of commercial loans over the past 24 years by matching each deal with over 40 of the top funding sources in America. So Terry, can you start by defining how much a deal sponsor actually has to put in of their own money? In the previous video, you mentioned that it's essential that they have skin in the game and they put a minimum of 10%, but that 20% is better. Hey, well, right now, my company, Apartment Loan Store, is working on the financing for a first-time syndicator who is putting in just that 10% you're talking about. Now, don't think that you could just do that because now in this case, this guy's experienced, not with syndication, but he does already own a 12 unit apartment building and many, many, I think, you know, like over 40 single family rentals. So you could get your foot in the door with just 10% only because this is the minimum that most lenders will accept. Uh, we have, I'll go into uh, the lending part towards the end of this video. Okay. okay. Uh, however, most of my experience indicators are putting more like 20, if not 25% of their own funds in, which gives them a lot more clout with investors. Okay, so I'm really curious as to how these how the profits are split in a syndication between sponsors and passive investors. Oh, okay, I have seen this done so many different ways. I can't think of any two deals actually that were done the same. I don't know why, but it seems like they start out with you know really uh, rosy, you know ideas of what they would like to get and it changes. And then by the time they end up with where they're going to be and they negotiate it a bit, uh, it ends up being quite different. There are two methods though uh, of splitting profits, the straight split method or the preferred return method, which could or could not have a waterfall. Wow, seriously, a waterfall? I, I need to hear more about this. <laughs> okay, well, you don't want to get too close to the waterfall or you might get wet. Uh, okay, bad joke. Uh, I will go over waterfalls in just a moment. Okay, we're going to start out with a straight split method, like a 2080 split. Since it's so simple, the sponsor puts in like 20% of the down payment, they usually get 20% of the profits. Makes sense, huh? Right. And the, yeah, the passive investors, investors, of course, get 80%. Well, that that actually doesn't seem fair since the passive investors do so little work compared with the sponsors. So shouldn't the sponsors get paid additionally for all the work that they put in? Absolutely. Passive investors might put in just like maybe at the most 50 hours of their time to evaluate the deal. And sometimes they just have the professionals do it for them. And it's quite different though for the sponsors. Uh, and I can assure you that this is not locked in stone, that you have to have uh, the same amount that the sponsor invests is what they earn. The sponsors will be putting in like thousands of hours over many years to acquire the property, do all the due diligence, apply for financing, oversee management, handle distributions, eventually even refinancing and eventually selling the property. So even if a sponsor puts in only 10% of the equity, they should, in my opinion, be compensated for all their time. I think they should earn at least 20% of the profits. If you get 25%, go for it. This is gonna be a balancing act though between what 
other syndicators are getting these days, especially experienced ones, and what you can get by if you're new, by just put, and you just want to just put what you want in your offering. First-time syndicators usually accept less though on their first deal, but but surprisingly, whatever's in the offering quite often is what people accept. Okay, so in your view, what is the preferred return method of splitting earnings? What's the ideal? Okay, and this one is more complicated. I'm going to try to make this simple. The preferred return method, the first money distributed up to an agreed upon amount, all of it, I mean, all of it goes to the passive investors and it's called a preferred return. Or if you want to talk uh, syndication lingo, it's called a pref. <laughs> today, Today, this is only around 6%. I can remember when these preferred returns had to be at least 8%, maybe 12%. Okay. Maybe, you know, it may be and certainly 10%. But because of the low cash on cash returns we're seeing on investment properties today, this is not really possible. Uh, to find out why you know, cash on cash returns are so low, be sure to watch my video on cash on cash returns. But getting back uh, to this, uh, to this form of distributing money, uh, income, when the property reaches a threshold on profits of 6%, all the earnings go to the passive investors for their preferred return. Now, this is where the waterfall structure comes in, which is used to incentivize sponsors to make the property more profitable. And if you happen to be a uh, passive investor watching this video, you really want a waterfall structure because you want your sponsors to really be smart and you want them to think of really great value adds and ways of making the property more profitable. And if they do, they should be rewarded. Well, the waterfall structure does that. Okay, so picture the waterfall as one level of a, a cascading down to another. Excess profit is between six and 8% might get split 25, 75, with 25% going to the sponsor and 75% going to passive investors. Now, this is the first level of the waterfall. Excess profits between 8% and 12% 12 cascade down to a 40, 60 level with 40% to the sponsor and 60% to the passive investors. And when excess profits hit above 12%, the excess profits cascade down to a 50-50 level, let's say. It's not written in stone again. And you know, of course, 50% goes to the sponsors, 50% goes to the passive investors. Okay, Terry, so how many waterfalls can there be? Let's see. Well, there's usually about maybe 60, 70. Hey, <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, the most... The, <laughs> Uh, the most I've ever seen, the most I've ever seen is five. Okay, so let's move on to the fee syndicators charge. I know all of you future syndicators are going to want to know this one. Mm -hmm. As a syndicator, not only will you be earning income from operations and selling the property, but it is standard to charge a 1% acquisition fee. And what I love about this one, and most even first time syndicators get this, is that it's going to help compensate you for all the ancillary fees that it's taken you to get this deal going, including the earnest money. So anyway, now moving on, a 1% to 3% property management fee is pretty standard, but this is going to be waived if the property is professionally managed. But if the syndicator also manages the property, they need to be compensated. Okay, and then there's a dis disposition fee, fee when selling the property. And most syndicators charge a percent for that. Some don't charge anything. Uh, you've got to have it in your offering memorandum. Some syndicators also charge a 1% of the uh, loan for refinancing the property. So, and you're not going to know, you know, if the property is just soaring in value and, you know, the whole group might decide to, uh, you know, if it, you know, just to have it in the offering memorandum that you have the option of, uh, uh, just doing a cash flow refinance and dispersing some of those funds to the investors. And then they can stay in and make more money in the future. So, yeah. So right now it kind of what's coming up for me is I think this sounds like nickel and diming, like our syndicators just taking private investors for as much as they can get with all the fees and fees and fees. 
Okay, it, uh, it could sound like that, but as mentioned, syndicators will be putting in thousands of hours of work. Right. And I think it's okay for them to have many ways of compensating themselves. And it's also, I've seen this happen unfortunately far too many times where uh, it's just taken longer for the property to, uh, to stabilize, to get the value adds done. In the meantime, quite you know, if, if you're smart, you'll set it up in your offering so that the preferred return doesn't start until you know you have money coming in, you know, on income. And they could, you know, as opposed to otherwise, I've seen it where it's just you know accumulates, you know, uh, and like a loan, you know, but you don't want that. So uh, but if so if that happens where you, you know, the, where all the money is going to, you know, it happens that the preferred return is, you know, uh, that all all the money from that is going taking all the profits, then it's great to have other ways of making income so you get compensated. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Surprisingly, these fees are usually put into the offering and most passive investors, as I mentioned, just seem to accept them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, they probably know. Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, well, they probably know the road ahead and they understand and they don't, that's not the part of the deal that they want a part of, right? Is all that. Uh, uh, Yes, absolutely. So okay, I'd like to move on to the qualifications it takes for private investors to join up with you. As required by the SEC, most investors are accredited investors who will need to have an annual income of 200,000. If they file, they file a joint tax return, this has to be 300,000, or they have to just be, or just have to have a net worth of $1 million. Do you understand that? It's just either one or the other, or it could be both. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Now, a private investor can also qualify by being a sophisticated investor. I've done this at times, but I, and I've also joined many uh, uh, syndications as uh, an accredited investor. But for a sophisticated investor, all they need is to have, uh, they just need to have experience, professional experience, I should say, so they understand all you know, the entire investment and like how the numbers work, how you know what crunching the numbers brings up. Uh, we're looking at uh, people who are CPAs, bankers, commercial loan brokers, people like me can fit uh, this. But I, I have to say, I've not seen very many sophisticated uh, investors, but I've certainly, most of them are accredited. Okay, so Terry, who finances these syndicated real estate deals? Okay, and this, probably is the most important thing to know. And I'm going to tell you, community banks, they don't really, they really just don't even understand syndications. And if they do, they certainly don't like them and they don't trust them. Large national banks and securitized commercial loan programs like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, and commercial mortgage-backed security funds called CMBS funds, and many private debt fund lenders, most bridge lenders, especially if they're not recourse, uh, they, they'll finance a syndicated deal. Okay, so you've made it clear that forming a real estate syndication is a technical process and it has daunting responsibilities. And then to follow all those SEC guidelines and rules, I mean, it must be worth it to do these deals or we wouldn't be making this video. So how does someone learn how to do all this, Terry? Okay, well, I'm going to tell you the only way to really learn how to do it, unfortunately, is by doing it. And, but you're not going to want to start there because, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, that you're going to be risking a lot of people's money and you don't want to really, you know, you, you want to know what you're doing. So what you're going to do is you're going to read some books, watch more YouTube videos like this one. In fact, watch this one about five or six times. No, right? yes. just joking yes. about that. Uh, <laughs> then put the whole process under the guidance of a good syndication attorney. These guys are amazing and they will make you look even better. The best part about getting a syndication attorney is that they will put together for you a, a, pli a private placement memorandum. That's a mouthful. And these, these days, these can look like glossy bro brochures, but they put everything into perspective for your borrower, borrowers, for your investors, I mean. Uh, plus, they have, you know, they sell the deal for you, you know, everything about it. Okay, and 
just don't forget that your offering has to be in compliance and this is not something you want to wing it on and the uh, right. real this the syndication attorney will absolutely make sure that this is done one so you're very, in compliance with the sec right yes so, yes right. yes exactly you don't want to go to jail because you know which you know can't happen okay won't happen but can't happen one very easy to understand book I want to mention, which is amazing. It's very short. It's called, oh my God, I love this title. I wish I had written this book. It's called Syndicating is a Bitch by Bruce Peterson. Oh, I, I, I know this book. It's been bouncing around my house for the last probably year and a half or so. <laughs> okay. Well, well, Korea's husband's a baker, a bank, not a baker. <laughs> he's not a baker. He's a, <laughs> he's a banker. And yeah, he's been studying. I know he's been studying syndications. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'd love to do uh, a longer video sometime and still that title. But anyway, it's been fun doing this video. Thanks. Yeah, no, it has been definitely. So for current rates and terms on Terry's loan programs, you can find a link to the apartment loan store below. And to read a sample of Terry's book, you can also find a link below. If you want to see more videos on everything commercial real estate, leave us a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button so you get a notification every time a new video drops. Thanks for watching this one, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode.